Assalamu alaikum. alaykum. Um, okay. I'm the only one that bothered to turn up out of the three of us. Uh, RMJM has, was set up in the 1950s. <coughs> We've been in the region, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> We've been in the region for a few years. Uh, there's a picture of Prince Charles, the future king, uh, collecting the Aga Khan Award. I, I wasn't there at the time. Um, and then a timeline of the future buildings. Um, we've got about 2,000 people in the practice and 28 studios. Uh, it's got a 67-year heritage. Just very briefly, a series of projects we've delivered from the Dubai office. Um, hotels, retail, beachfront projects, towers. Um, you know, some extraordinary stuff that um, you can't really do in Europe, just amazing projects, I think. Um, I'd just like to step back, because I'm going to show you a project which is in the holy city of Mecca. So, back in 1968, RMJM actually began by doing a series of master plans for the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. And at that time, the population was 235,000 people. Um, and this very kind of childish, cute drawing was the kind of product that you'd need for a master plan back in the day. And I kind of wish that we, we could go back to that in, in many ways. Um, <clears throat> so Mecca, obviously a, a city with very intricate small plots, um, which it still is today, uh, quite difficult to navigate around. Um, so I'm just going to show you one project, which is Thacker Gardens. And it, it's an attempt to create a calm retreat within a very commercially driven scheme. I mean, most of the schemes you work on are, are commercially driven, they have to develop, deliver value. But as architects, I think we have to, in, in a kind of um, respectful way, push back against clients to try and create kind of human public spaces within the projects, which is a difficult task. So 56 years later on from the master plan of, of Mecca, we have 2.2 million people, and everybody looking for shade, for sanctuary, uh, for somewhere calm. Um, the project I'm going to show you is situated two and a half kilometers away from the Haram. It's about 350 meters in elevation um, towards the mountains, and we have great views out towards the Al Hira Mountains. Uh, we were asked to do a series of master plan. We were asked to do a master plan of nine plots, which which essentially moved up the hill. Um, and I'm going to very briefly talk to you about Thacker Gardens on the top right. But e each of the clusters within the master plan had a kind of identity, uh, a linear scheme based around streets, uh, a central scheme which we call the enclosed scheme, which was more of a, a kind of um, set of cloisters and um, a stepped scheme. And this uh, Thacker Gardens on the top right stepped because of its geography, which I'll take you through to. We, we extensively walked the site because the human scale of these projects is really important. How, how to connect a master plan together on foot, by bus, by train, um, by car. So the particular project I'm going to show you very briefly is, is three hotels surrounded by 18-storey buildings. A really, really difficult project. Um, we went through the, the typical journey of maximizing the site. Uh, for the client, and to keep this very succinct, we, we arrived at what we call the consolidated scheme, which is uh, three towers. <clears throat> a slightly dry slide, but a very important slide. Typically on projects like this, the, 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 the ground levels are parking, um, and we, we went through extensive conversations with the client uh, and discussions about it, costs. To, to push down all the stuff that we didn't want to see below ground into the rock. A very expensive thing to do. Which then released spaces at ground level <clears throat> for, for public activities. Uh, what was extraordinary about the site is that it actually sloped almost 30 meters from the lowest level to the highest level. And between nine meters from one side of the site to the other side of the site. So kind of three dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Um, so for the efficiency of the buildings, we extruded the three hotels 19 stories up, um, which, I mean, it's a simple drawing, but 
to actually create space at ground floor for people, which isn't conflicted by the back of house functions, the parking, waste strategy, all that difficult stuff we have to deal with is quite, is quite something. Um, we then took the three blocks and we articulated them into in, in, in relation to required setbacks and to the site boundaries and actually that allowed us to create buildings which had opportunities to get better views out from uh, these kind of quite <coughs> vertical blocks. Um, hotels have service floors, what do you do with them? We managed to squeeze them down so that we could create an actual uh, terrace, mid-level terrace, to get views out towards the Haram. Ground floor, um, restaurant floors, retail, but importantly, we wanted all of these to be connected in three dimensions, both laterally and transversely. <coughs> Um, luckily, the prevailing wind is north, and because the towers were lifted above the podium, we could actually naturally ventilate the spaces. And here we have the overall massing, where we basically we squeezed in as much as we could in terms of, of, of public space and green space within a commercially driven scheme. Apologies for the dull slide, but it's important to say that uh, working with really great consultants who understand back of house, who understand vertical transportation, so that we could release the spaces in between the building as open spaces. <clears throat> so this is a cross section through the the towers. Um, it's, it's kind of difficult to understand the complexity of the changes in level, but the design driver for this was that everybody could get to everything at the lower levels via stairs, via ramps, and via bridge links. <coughs> Materiality. We're on a rock. We're on a mountainside. We wanted the extrusion of the podium to be something to do with its, its location. And so the, the ground floor podium, we wanted that to be made, basically made of stone. And then the upper levels, sort of calm building elevations where we control views and solar gain. Uh, and, and this basically shows the complexity that we had to deal with. Three very, very close buildings. Um, so 18 meters apart from each other, the two ones at the rear. How, how do you deal with, with privacy and, and solar shading? Um, so we basically had to come up with a series of, of strategies for, for how we deal with that. Um, using vertical fins, using the skin of the building to keep the efficiency high. Uh, an example of one of the wall types where privacy was important and we had to create opaque panels at 30 degrees so the views were um, between the buildings rather than looking at the buildings. <coughs> and here's a general view, work in progress view of, of the three towers. Moving to another scale, um, we want the building to be calm and respectful within its, within its context. So working with the lighting consultant to make sure that we had a, a subtle and clever lighting strategy that worked with the elevations of the buildings. And um, although it's a kind of detail, the importance of concealing light sources so that you're, you're subtly led into spaces rather than being shown into them. Um, so working really at the small scale, detailed human scale level. Um, I'll, I'll whiz through this because time's short, but essentially we created three gardens and you can see that the topography of the site meant that getting from one side of the street to the other side of the street was complex, but we saw this as an opportunity to create lateral connections between these three gardens. Um, <clears throat> so the first garden we called, the, we gave each garden an identity. 
We call the first garden the Sears Garden, and this is a series of steps which navigated nine meters from one side to the other. Um, <clears throat> the central soup garden, which was based upon creating a series of, of louvers which would create beautiful shadows and calm, which we then integrate water features and, and beautiful detailing in terms of the stone, the landscape, hard landscape. So really thinking about the human scale. And a third garden, <coughs> excuse me, a third garden called Gateway Garden, which is a series of steps which leads you down south towards the Haram. How do you cleverly embed local references into, into this project at every level? And I've just put up one slide of how we, how we approach that. Rather than going to buy plants from all over the world, we, we worked closely with our landscape team to choose Saudi Arabian plants, local plants. So too, moving right down to the human scale, we're, in, we're on the side of a mountain and we wanted the signage, we wanted everything that you touch to be part of the local landscape. <coughs> this is actually my final slide. And I put this up because this is the DA Heritage Village in Saudi. And it basically does everything that I've talked about in the last 20 slides. It's 1,200 years old. It emerges from the rock. It uses a, a, a really limited panel, a palette of materials in a really beautiful way. It, it navigates changes in level using ramps and stairs. It has, a, it has facades which are you know, cleverly detailed to control the amount of solar gain and, and restrict views. Um, and it was, as I said, it's, it's 1,200 years old. And it was done without architects, engineers, vertical transportation consultants. You know, it's kind of all there. So, this was actually one of the first slides that we presented to the client. Um, and as we develop the project, we always refer back to that to try and show how we relate to the kind of extraordinary Saudi Arabian kind of culture. Um, so, that's a kind of whistle stop tour of one project. Uh, and I think we have uh, a small animation. Again, work in progress. Um, I think it's got some sound.